So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for sharing this time and this space with us. Can you introduce yourself and tell us who you are? My name is Martha Flowers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my own name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when and where were you born? I was born in Winston-Salem, mm -hmm. North Carolina, mm -hmm. not far from here. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up back near my old hometown. Mm -hmm. So how was Winston-Salem growing up? Winston-Salem was the most wonderful, wonderful place for me to grow up. The teachers at school were exciting and full of enthusiasm, and they were so helpful. But I owe a lot to my father, who was a Baptist minister. Mm. And his emphasis was on discipline and education. Mm -hmm. And so that was my background. But Winston-Salem was a very forward-looking city because we had our own bus company. Mm. So we didn't have to ride the segregated buses. Mm -hmm. And that was a milestone yes. back in 1940s, 30s and 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. And so it was a pleasure in that way. Mm -hmm. And the town itself was a very wonderful place for black people because the factories were there mm -hmm. that provided employment. Mm -hmm. And so my uncles and my mother and all of my relatives were employed at Reynolds Tobacco Company. Wow. They were then able to buy homes. They were able to educate them, their children. And I myself was able to have a very full and not a life of lack mm -hmm. in any way. Wow. They also provided musical outlets. There was a program that featured children from the high school and elementary school to sing on the radio on Saturday. And I got experience doing that. Mm -hmm. And so Winston-Salem was an exciting place to grow up mm -hmm. in. The music was vibrant. The churches were lively. Mm -hmm. And there were so many opportunities to sing, which was the love of my young life, <laughs> beginning even in kindergarten. Wow. Tell me about that. How did you know that you could sing? Well, my father was a minister, and so we were in church a great deal. Mm -hmm. And there were church choirs. And so I went to the Wentz Memorial Ele uh, Kindergarten mm -hmm. when I was three years old. Oh, wow. You went to kindergarten at three. At three. Wow. And there we were all sitting on the floor, floor with our teachers, the two teachers who were very nurturing and friendly and inspiring. Mm -hmm. And my first performance really was at the nursery school. I first heard the sound of applause after my singing. They had given a play of a family, a mother. The part was given to one of the children to be the mother. And there was the father. And the teacher was picking people for the parts. And I had not been given a part, and I was not happy at that time, but then later I found out 
that I would be given a part. And the evening of the concert program, at one point, the mother said to the father, let's turn on the radio. And they came over to a big box and twisted a knob, and I began singing <laughs> in that box. I was the radio, and up I popped at the end of the play and the audience was so enthusiastic and happy. And I first was acknowledged by the audience and that was just a, amazing. A star was born. <laughs> I was so excited. And from then on, I think I wanted to sing and I did sing. So you mentioned that your dad was a Baptist minister. How influential was the church in your experience as a as the church was up. very influential. My father usually had a church out of town mm -hmm. and he was away a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we attended First Baptist Church, my mother and I and mm -hmm. my brother. And so singing there, they had programs featuring the young people mm -hmm. and I was always on the program. Mm -hmm. And so that was a good experience. The churches in Winston-Salem were very, very influential mm -hmm. in the community. The ministers were the leaders mm -hmm. in the community. And so in high school, I still wanted to sing. And there was a teacher who taught a course in Negro history. And during that course, we turned to a page in the book that showed us Fisk University Jubilee Hall. Ah, and they talked about the Jubilee Singers. I ran home after school and told my mother, I want to go to Fisk University. And that was a dream that I had and kept. What grade were you in when you decided I was in my last year of elementary school. Wow. So I guess that was the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you, you ran home. Can, do you remember what your house looked like? Then? <laughs> <laughs> I have to laugh because the house that my father bought for us really had been a church that, he, that they made into a house. And so it was not a large house at all, mm -hmm. it was small, but it was filled with joy. And this of course was before television. Mm -hmm. And what we liked to do most of all was to sit around the fire in the evening and sing together. Mm -hmm. And we sang from a book called The Favorite songs, and it had all kinds of songs, patriotic songs, My Country Tis of Thee. It had a section of spirituals. Mm -hmm. It had a collection of all kinds of music. And so that was a great experience for me to have had that kind of activity at home. So whenever anyone wanted someone to sing, I was ready mm -hmm. with a so song. So were there any other singers in your family? My mother had okay. a lovely voice, mm -hmm. but she did not really sing in any choirs. My brother could not harmonize, <laughs> and so he sang the melody with my mother. And actually, I sang the harmony, the alto, and my father sang baritone. This was all a cappella. Wow. And so my ear was being trained as a singer and I didn't realize it at that time. Mm -hmm. But that was a good, good lesson for me mm -hmm. later on. Can you tell me a little more about your dad? I remember reading in your memoirs, you said that it was best when he was away. What did you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> he was such a disciplinarian. <laughs> I never knew that supper time was supposed to be enjoyable because there my father would be talking about 
what one should do and what one should not do. And he would, he was a, a fine speaker. Mm -hmm. And I think we were the audience, my brother and I and my mother. And so, you had to sit and listen. <laughs> so we had to listen to those discipline, disciplinary talks that my father gave. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful inspiration yeah. because his standards were high. Mm -hmm. We did not use poor English mm -hmm. or incorrect English. We did not speak slang language. And no singing of popular songs either. Wow. All the songs had to be religious ones. Mm -hmm. I read that your dad graduated from a &T. He did not graduate, but he, he attended. But he attended. And he always spoke about it. And that gave my brother inspiration to attend a &T and graduate later. Yes, from especially that during school. that time for a black man to attend college was an achievement. Oh, it was a, a rarity. Yeah. Because that was not too late. Yeah. From slavery mm -hmm. times. Yeah. And money was very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. In fact, most students in college worked their way through college. college. Tell me about your brother. My brother Hamilton <laughs> was an inspiration. He was five years older than I was. And I always used to cry for a sister. But my mother said, oh, I'm sorry. We have no more children. We are going to have no more children. Mm -hmm. But my brother was, he was wonderful because after dinner, we had to wash the dishes. And while washing the dishes, we recited poetry. I learned Shakespeare, to be or not to be. Mm -hmm. I learned poems and recited them as we did the dishes. Wow. And so when I went later on to school, to my high schools, I knew poems and I could recite them from memory because I had practiced them with my brother while doing the dishes <laughs> after dinner. You mentioned um, you were attracted to Fisk you heard the Jubilee Singers, and you knew that's where you were going. I read in your memoirs that your principal didn't want to sign the, the letter for you to go. Can you tell me about he that? He did not sign. I wanted to get a scholarship and a recommendation. Mm -hmm. I had been a good student in high school, I felt. I had won the oratorical contest first prize twice and enjoyed it so much. And I was inspired to go to Fisk University. And my mother had said, you will go. Mm -hmm. I will see to it that you go. But when I spoke to the principal, he said no. He would not give me a recommendation. Did you ever find out why? I don't know why. So how did, you, um, how did your mom make provisions for My you to go? My mother worked for R.J. Reynolds. Oh, wow. She worked in the factories. And I remember so well meeting her after her job. I would meet my mother coming home from work and skip along with her <laughs> in such happiness. And my mother also bought stock in R.J. Reynolds. I remember her saying, once in a while, oh, the stock paid a dividend. Where did she learn about stock? At R.J. Reynolds, wow. the company. They encouraged the people who worked there mm -hmm. to invest in the, company. in the company. And that was unusual at that time. Mm -hmm. I think that was a very forward-looking activity. So the move to Nashville, uh, was it just you and your mom that went initially? I went alone oh, by to Nashville. Mm -hmm. Oh, I packed my clothes and I was so excited. Mm -hmm. I had also met Juanita Hayes, who was going to go to Fisk University as well mm -hmm. as a freshman student. 
And so we met on the train and off we went to Fisk University. And it was so exciting, although we were in, I think, the segregated car mm -hmm. near the engine. I think it was up the front. Oh, wow. But we had our lunch and we had our dreams. Mm -hmm. And that was so exciting. We arrived at Nashville, Tennessee, and were met, could you believe it, in big white limousines and taken to the campus. Extraordinary. Yes. And Jubilee Hall that I had read about in my elementary school was where I went to have a room. And there were four of us in that room, Juanita Hayes and two young ladies from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Clara Allen was from Orangeburg and Twyla Jackson, I think, was from Charleston. Wow. How wonderful to have those roommates. Yes. And so it began a wonderful experience at Fisk University. And to be there to sing with the Fisk University Choir, which broadcast on Sunday over the radio. My mother said she heard me sing solo with the Fisk University Jubilee Choir mm -hmm. from Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. On the radio, on the she radio. heard me. Did she get to visit you on campus? Anywhere? Oh, no, she never visited. But at Christmas time, we came home for the holidays and then back again. So the Fisk Jubilee Choir, was that a separate group from the Jubilee Singers? The choir was made up of just students at the school. Mm -hmm. At the time when I was at Fisk University, the Jubilee Singers were touring. And there were, I think, five of them in that group. They were professional mm -hmm. singers and they were being paid to sing. The choir was made up of students who sang on campus. And so we all know that the Jubilee Singers, is they're the reason why Negro spirituals were raised to the level of the concert stage. Do you, did you know how important Negro spirituals were before going to Fisk, even with your experiences singing them at home? Yes, I knew spirituals were very, very important. Mm -hmm. And John Work, yes. Professor John Work, who taught me theory, music theory. John Work taught you music theory. He did. And he was on the <laughs> faculty there at Fisk University. He's the author of all the books that we study about spirituals. Exactly. Wow. What a wonderful teacher he was. So patient mm -hmm. and so caring. And this is what I found at Fisk University. Although most of the faculty members were white, mm -hmm. they were very nurturing mm -hmm. and very caring. I studied Italian language. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Denton Russell, mm -hmm. who was the, the, he was the voice teacher. And there I had really my first voice lessons. Wow. I was introduced to vocalizing, and I vocalized in the music building with such enthusiasm. My voice was ringing out all over the campus. <laughs> <laughs> and were you a voice major? I majored in voice. I had a role in three operas that he produced. The first one was Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> and I played the part of Gretel. Can you imagine? I can't. I that know you was were so cute. Oh, <laughs> so exciting. And Lenora Lafayette mm -hmm. was Hansel. Wow. That was my second year at Fisk. The third year at Fisk, he produced The Marriage of Figaro mm -hmm. by Mozart. Mm -hmm. And I was given the role of Susanna. Wow. What a pleasure. Did you With, know how to learn an opera role? Well, we rehearsed it. Mm -hmm. We practiced it. But we sang these operas, this opera in English. Mm -hmm. And oh, how wonderful. The story of the opera, yes. Marriage of Figaro, had a lot of comedy in it. And the singing, the music was 
absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. The costumes were sent from New York. Oh, wow. We had makeup and, and wigs to look like the persons who lived at that time. And also, the last year was really the greatest of all. Madam Butterfly mm. was given with parts of the Nashville Symphony Orchestra oh, wow. as the accompaniment. Oh, I was in heaven. What an opportunity for a college student. Absolutely unusual. And it must have been provided by the Spirit of God mm -hmm. that I came to Fisk at that time. Mm -hmm. During that time, to study opera. I had said I wanted to be an opera singer in Winston-Salem, and everyone looked at me with some <laughs> astonishment and wondered why I wanted to choose such a career. Mm -hmm. But it was in, embedded in my spirit. It chose you. It chose <laughs> me somehow. And I was definitely led by God's spirit and power to go to Fisk at that time when this wonderful Denton Russell professor was there. He painted the scenery and built it. He ordered the costumes. He directed the music, of course, at the performance. And the night that I made my entrance as Madame Butterfly on stage, it was miraculous. It was heaven, the experience that I have never forgotten. During that time to be in, in an environment of an HBCU, Fisk University is one of the, the leading historically black colleges and universities. Do you remember what the city was like outside of the nurturing environment of the, the university campus? I did not visit the city much, mm -hmm. except the last year I did go to choose a dress downtown, and it was quite acceptable oh, good. at that time. Mm -hmm. The people who helped me into my new dress were very, very friendly, but most of the activities were on the campus or near the campus in restaurants that were black owned mm -hmm. and the food was absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there were black businesses in Nashville, mm -hmm. photographers mm -hmm. and businessmen. Meharry Medical yes. School was across the street. Mm -hmm. And so there were plenty of escorts, which was a pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the doctors. <laughs> so at that time, you knew you wanted to pursue a career in opera. What had you learned about that genre as a career for black singers? My focus was not on how it could be done. Mm -hmm. I simply didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. I simply focused on perfecting my art, yes. perfecting my voice, learning my music, attending my classes when I got into the Juilliard School. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it, how it could be done or how it could be brought about. That was not my focus. I felt that somehow, if I was good enough, the way would be provided. So, Juilliard, t tell me about the move to New York. Well, my brother was there getting a master's degree from Columbia University. Wow. And so I lived in Brooklyn with him for a year till I got my bearings. And then I moved to, to Harlem. Mm -hmm. And there 
was St. Martin's Episcopal Church, where one of my roommates at Fisk had an aunt who belonged to that church. Mm -hmm. And so I went there and auditioned for the minister mm -hmm. who liked my voice. And the organist had been the pianist for Marian Anderson. Oh, wow. Did you know that at the time? I did not, but I learned it later. And so I was accepted and hired as a soloist at St. Martin's Church and was paid $125 a month, which was a, a good amount of money mm -hmm. for a student. What a wonderful opportunity for me to sing and be, have a salary mm -hmm. as well. That opportunity was God sent. Yes. There I sang the Handel Arias. We did the Messiah, songs from the Messiah. The choir was on a, all of the music was on a very classical level. It was an Episcopal church and most of the members were from the West Indies. Oh, wow. And so they had learned that music in their countries where they came from, which was most of those countries were, were under the auspices of the English. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful opportunity for me. Yes. Did and you I, have that job even while you I, were in school? I kept that job at school mm -hmm. and f for many years after school, mm -hmm. I still sang as soloist at St. Martin's Church. And at that time, among singers, they would say, I would hear them say, oh, I wouldn't sing in a choir. I wouldn't sing. I'm a soloist now. But I was so happy mm -hmm. to sing in the choir because after the choir sang, there would be members from the church waiting for me afterward to congratulate me on my singing and to congratulate the choir because it was really fine music and very well done. So tell me about Juilliard. Juilliard, my dream come true. Yes. <laughs> to be at Juilliard and to study with Florence Page Kimball. Also, Leontine Price was a student. She was one year ahead of me, and she had come to Juilliard from Wilberforce yes. to study at Another the Another HBCU. Absolutely, yes. and I was from Fisk. Mm -hmm. And so we had the same teacher. Florence Page Kimball was a fine voice teacher. She didn't do much explaining, but somehow, she managed to instill in me a vocal technique that lasted and grew tremendously. As a student, my voice developed. It was never a big voice mm -hmm. because I'm not a big person. I was a light lyric soprano. Mm -hmm. I had started out at Fisk as a coloratura mm, mm -hmm. because I did have the notes and the agility. high C and the agility above high C. But as, my, as I matured, the voice matured as well. Mm -hmm. And so I was a lyric, light lyric soprano. And Miss Kimball always cautioned me not to force the voice, let the voice sing. Mm. Don't try to make the voice sing. And I remembered that when I began to teach singing, yes. that you let the voice sing. So wise. What were the academics like at Julia? <laughs> we studied languages, of course. Yes. Engl uh, English diction, mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. 
and French diction and Italian diction. And so languages were emphasized because on the concert stage, you must know these languages and sing them well. Mm -hmm. And so I enjoyed that. And Miss Kimball also had teachers that she knew who were not at the Juilliard that she sent her students privately. Paula Frisch, the great Danish singer, was one of my coaches in French because she had known the singer Debussy. She had known these French composers mm -hmm. and had worked with them. And so I had wonderful French diction and German diction with a woman named Frau Braun. Yes. <laughs> who was very strict. And so my diction was emphasized. The German leader songs we sang in her class mm -hmm. had been meticulously studied mm -hmm. and practiced. And Italian, of course. Of course, yeah. Italian was the language of love <laughs> and the language of vowels. Mm -hmm, yes. And so we studied and practiced and vocalized, and it was the joy of my life. Did you get to sing it in operas at Juilliard? Oh, at the Juilliard, of course. Mm -hmm. Johnny Skeeky. Yes. <laughs> but the most wonderful of all was my last year at the Juilliard. Cosi van Tutti mm -hmm. was given, and I sang the role of Fior di Ligi. Yes. What a wonderful, wonderful production mm -hmm. with costumes and with the Juilliard Orchestra. It was meticulously studied and rehearsed. I have pictures of that production. Mm -hmm. And there I am on stage with all of the other singers. And in the audience that night was the director of Porgy and Bess. That is when they heard me sing. Okay. And decided that they want wanted me in the company. I was just gonna ask you, how did you get involved with that Poor Game Best tour? The director called Miss Kimball the next day and said to her, we must have Martha Flowers. <laughs> and in two weeks, I had packed my luggage and was off to sing in Poor Game Best. The, night, the day I arrived was the day Leontine Price left. She had been with the company touring in Europe, and I had seen her in Porgy and Bess in New York. Mm -hmm. For a year she had. Mm -hmm. And so I was signed, not as Bess, I was signed in the chorus and understudy to Clara. To Clara. Mm -hmm. I accepted gratefully, yes. most <laughs> gratefully. And every night during the performance, I sang with great gusto mm -hmm. and great happiness to be with a company like the company of Porgy and Bess, a professional mm -hmm. singers who were dedicated every evening to give the highest of, and best of their performances. Yes. And you were fresh out of Juilliard. Were you one of the youngest in the company? I don't know, <laughs> because there were children in the company. Right. Yeah. But I didn't feel that I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. I felt very much at home mm -hmm. with the company. Mm -hmm. And it was the joy of my life. Can you describe the tour? Like you guys were in the, you took the buses and you were in the city one day and you, what was it like? No, we, in the tour, we usually arrived in the city the day before mm -hmm. the performances mm -hmm. because the day of the, 
the day that we arrived, we would go to our hotels and get situated mm -hmm. and rested from the trip. But the day of the opening, we would go to the theater mm -hmm. and rehearse the show with the orchestra in whatever city we were in. We would walk the stage to see where our entrances and how the stage was mm -hmm. situated. So I would go to see where Porgy's house was. Mm -hmm. I would go to look to see where Clara oh, would be upstairs yes. to the balconies. So that when I made my entrance on stage, it would always be familiar. Mm -hmm. Catfish Row mm -hmm. would be my home yes. for the night. Yes. And how long would you stay in each city? We usually stayed in the cities for a week mm -hmm. and sometimes two weeks. You mentioned to me that uh, during this tour, Maya Angelou was your roommate. <laughs> <laughs> I have to laugh because I was always wanting to have a social life as well as a professional life. Mm -hmm. And one night in San Francisco, three friends and I decided to go out after the show. And so we ended up at a nightclub. And during that show, we sat there drinking cham a little bit of champagne mm -hmm. and there were roses on the table and we were having fun. And onto the stage came Maya Angelou doing her nightclub act, something about stirring peas in a pot. <laughs> and she was dressed in her African garb with her African turban on her head and her African dress. Mm -hmm. And she sang and she moved. And I was taken with her performance. Mm -hmm. After the performance, I ran, grabbed a rose and ran up to the stage and laid a rose at her feet. <laughs> I was so enthusiastic, and we all were. So the next day, I was having a rehearsal with Porgy and Bess because the Clara had become ill. Mm -hmm. Helen Colbert was her name. Mm -hmm. And I was to sing the role of Clara that evening at the performance. And so Ella Gerber, the assistant director, and Robert Breen were there showing me what Clara would do, and mm -hmm. I was being shown about that. And so they mentioned that someone was leaving, the dancer was leaving, and they would need a dancer. So I said to them, there's a dancer I saw at a nightclub, and she's wonderful. I think you should go and see her. She would be a great addition to our company. And they went and saw Maya Angelou and they hired her. She and I became roommates and from there we went, I think we went to Boston, Massachusetts and then we also went abroad to Venice. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the strawberry woman had left. Mm -hmm. And Robert Breen said to me, I want you to play the strawberry woman. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, but I'm not the type that usually mm -hmm. sings that role. Mm -hmm. He said, I will stage it again for you, and you will have your own personality in that role. And he did restage the strawberry woman, and I was in that, made my debut in Venice, Italy, as a strawberry woman. I know you stole the show. The applause was so <laughs> great that the audience would not stop applauding the next day, the newspaper said, 
in Italian, of course. Mm -hmm. The greatest moment of the evening was the singing and portrayal La Marchand de Fraise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a wonderful. I mean, and the Strawberry Woman is on stage for what, three minutes? What a blessing. But you stole the entire show. <laughs> what a blessing. So how long were you on the tour? I was with the International Company two year, two and a half years, I think. Mm -hmm. From 1954 to 1956. Mm -hmm. And from there, is that when you went to Paris or did you come back to- We the... went to Paris, we went so many places. Mm -hmm. We went to Greece. I made my debut as Bess in Athens, Greece. Oh, wow. And when Robert Greene said I would play Bess, I said, oh, can it be? Mm -hmm. It was your turn. The, one of the Besses was leaving mm -hmm. and someone needed to be re to replace mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm not tall yeah. <laughs> with long legs. <laughs> he said, that has nothing to do with your artistry. Yes. And so I was given the role and I, it was the greatest, one of the greatest moments in my life. Mm -hmm. So you lived in Paris though at one point, right? No. Okay. During that time, Porgy and Bess was traveling <clears throat> and I had in the meantime won the Naumburg Award. Okay. We were in Paris and we played in Paris for several weeks, mm -hmm. Porgy and Bess, mm -hmm. and I as Bess. But my concert was scheduled at Town Hall mm -hmm. in that December 4th. How was I to manage that? It was all arranged by my, by my wonderful teacher, Florence Page Kimball, mm -hmm. and the director, Robert Breen, mm -hmm. flew me back from Paris two weeks before the performance to rehearse the concert and give the concert at Town Hall on December 4th, wow. 1954. Mm -hmm. And then back to Paris right and after the And then I concert. flew immediately back to Paris. <laughs> but it was an amazing concert because they brought my father from Winston-Salem and my brother were there. My mother had passed away my last year at Fisk, okay. before my last year, and so she was not there. Mm -hmm. But she was there in spirit yes. and had been throughout my life. Yes. Had your father and brother had an opportunity to see you perform before or was this their first time? <laughs> They had never seen me perform professionally, mm -hmm. but they did, my brother saw me sing in Porgy and Bess mm -hmm. in Summerstock later mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. But that was a great, wonderful trip for my father, yes. who had been a tremendous influence mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. Porgy and Bess has such a complicated history, and uh, especially when it comes to singers. Did you ever feel that, that tug of war? Because there were some singers, and still today, who feel like they don't want to be pigeonholed into only being able to sing Porgy and Bess and not be able to sing The Countess and, you know, uh, Madam Butterfly. Did you ever have that kind of no, experience? No, I never focused on things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I have always been able or gifted in a way that permits me to focus entirely on my position mm -hmm. and my responsibility and my artistry. I have never ever allowed myself to become so involved in other aspects of the world mm -hmm. 
and the opinions of the world and the actions of the world and the actions of people towards me and my art, mm. which to me is a sacred given art given by God to me to protect and give and share yes. with the world to the best of my ability. That makes me so emotional. It's beautiful, yes. And that I think is why I have been spared to live to this age mm -hmm. in spite of what the world has said mm -hmm. and done. Mm -hmm. I will not allow myself to become a part of it. Yes, because you knew you had a purpose. And my purpose was God's purpose. Yes, yes. Oh, I love you. <laughs> and I'm here yes. with the blessing mm -hmm. of the University of North Carolina, which gave me a chance. Yes. I came here full of hope and admiration for a great university such as this mm -hmm. to hire me as a teacher and to be responsible as a teacher to, to help and nourish young singers. Mm -hmm. What an honor, yeah. what a privilege. And I kept that before me my entire years here, mm -hmm. letting nothing deter me from my work and my dedication to my work. Mm -hmm. How did you learn about the position here on The Voice? Joel Academy? Carter. Okay. Professor Joel Carter called me. Somehow I had been recommended by someone mm -hmm. in New York. Perhaps Betty Allen, mm. who was a colleague of mine, mm -hmm. had told the university about me mm -hmm. and my accomplishments. And Joel Carter called and spoke to me and said they wanted to hire me. Wow. So you didn't have to do an, an uh, interview, an audition? Oh, no, the, no, just no, no. your reputation? Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> I think as a performer, no one had the reputation that I did have mm -hmm. when I came here. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful. Mm -hmm. And I bless the spirit of Joel Carter and his wife as well, mm -hmm. who helped me in a new position alone. Mm -hmm. This aloneness has been the stabilizing force in my life. Mm -hmm. Because when I graduated from college, my father said, you have your degree now, you are on, on your own. Mm -hmm. You're on your own now. In other words, you cannot be supported any longer mm -hmm. by family or anyone. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, just me and God. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so when you came to UNC, do you remember what the reception was like from other faculty and students? The faculty was very, very friendly. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to say that my colleagues were nice people, good people, and the president of the university, Mr. Bill Friday, invited me to live with them for a while wow. until I could get my bearings. Mm -hmm. And I did live with him for a month or so. Mm -hmm. And that was a great pleasure and a great inspiration. Yes. How wonderful in the South to have such an invitation 
and acceptance, mm. knowing the South as it had been. Yes. Were you one of the very few black faculty on the entire campus? Oh, there were a few. Okay. Were you guys able to collaborate? We, or did, to... we did get together quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't remember their names yep. <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. But the black faculty members did meet and greet one another and know one another. Mm -hmm. And that was very good. What do you think, I read an article about you in the Daily Tar Heel, I think this might have been 1971 or so. What do you think your presence as a black faculty in the music department meant to black students? I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. I welcomed every student, regardless of who they were, mm -hmm what they were. The question was, do you like to sing? Yes. <laughs> and that's, that's what that is. Do you like to sing? Mm -hmm. And that is the question I always ask my students. Mm -hmm. Because your love for the art will guide you to perfection. Mm. Which is what you strive to be as an artist. You have so many quotes that I need to write down <laughs> and put on a t-shirt, this is fantastic. So um, I spoke to one of your former students that I shared with you and she said that you were a very warm and open teacher. What was your teaching style like? Did you talk about anatomy much or did you do symbolism or what was your style? My style was not talking. Mm -hmm. My style was vocalizing. Mm -hmm. I immediately went into the vocalizes. First of all, we spoke about the voice as an instrument mm -hmm. because it is an instrument. Yes. What kind of an instrument is it? Mm -hmm. A melodic? What makes the voice sing? The vibration of the vocal cords, air passing. The, the cords. voice, the piano. Mm -hmm. What kind of an instrument is it? Percussive. Percussive. Mm -hmm. The violin, mm -hmm. you draw the strings. Yes. The bow across the, bow. the strings. Mm -hmm. What causes your voice? to begin. It is a wind instrument. Yes, yes. And it is the breath passing through the vocal, uh, vocal cords, causing them to vibrate, mm -hmm. which makes the sound. Yes. Coupled with your desire to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we approach the singing lesson from that point of view Mm -hmm. When you were on faculty, did you get to perform as a solo artist? Oh, yes. Which? We had to give a concert every year mm -hmm. as a faculty member. Mm -hmm. And it was a pleasure mm -hmm. <laughs> because there I could demonstrate, practice what you preach. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the, the awesome things about, you know, teaching because the students, your students, they're in the audience and they're watching you and they want to see if you're doing everything you told them to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And she described, your former student described your performances and how regal you were. How did you dress when you used, uh, come into work? How did I dress? Yeah, what kind of ensembles? I know what I imagined how you would dress, but. <laughs> As a teacher? Yes. Oh, well, I, like, I never wore pants. Mm. I, I still don't wear pants mm -hmm. to this day for some reason. Yeah. I don't know. I admire the femininity mm. of a dress or skirts. Mm -hmm. It's in my spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always had a dress mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. or a dress and a jacket. Mm -hmm. 
or a dress and a stole, mm -hmm. but never pants. I remember um, looking at some of your pictures and you described your gowns and I saw some of those. Did you have the same uh, level of gowns when you were on faculty here? <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there was a dressmaker who lives in Carver now. Oh, wow. Who made a couple of uh, gowns for me. A very fine dressmaker. There are so m many extraordinarily talented people in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that attracted me to this city. Mm -hmm. When you moved here, did you anticipate that you would retire here and stay? Never. <laughs> I only intended to stay a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But I looked around and my spirit was saying to me, this is a wonderful place. It's friendly, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. and it's spiritual. When I was in Europe, a lot of people asked, it said, is it a very religious town? Because <laughs> the name Chapel. is Chapel Hill. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So how long did you teach at UNC? Eight years. Eight years. And why'd you leave, do you remember? I was not rehired. Hmm. And I must say I had no regrets mm -hmm. because I felt that it was time to move on. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I would stay here in Chapel Hill, but I had planned to stay. Mm -hmm. I had bought seven houses. Wow. So you got into real estate. I decided to have another career mm -hmm. as well as music. So did they give you a reason? No. Mm -hmm. And you didn't? I did not inquire. You didn't inquire, okay. But I stayed an ex they gave me an extra year to stay. Mm -hmm. And I took that extra year. Mm -hmm. While I was here at Chapel Hill at the university, I taught every summer. And that was what enabled me to buy the houses. I befriended George Tate, who was a real estate agent here. Mm -hmm. And I was told not to collaborate with him by some people. But I think it's important to listen to God mm -hmm. and to not listen so much to what people say. I said, I'll take my chances and I'll let God do the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. Mm -hmm. And so he taught you about buying houses? And yes, mm -hmm. he, was, he was a good friend for many years. Mm -hmm. But I didn't buy all the houses from him. Mm -hmm. Someone simply came and offered me the house. Mm -hmm. A gentleman that I had known, he and his wife, his wife had passed away, and so he said, I want to sell my house. Would you like to buy it? Mm -hmm. And that's the way it happened. With God's help, I felt I could do it. Having been told by some people, what do you know about real estate? Mm -hmm. well. God knows all about it. Mm -hmm. And I'll depend on his guidance and his protection and God's wisdom, as I always have done. Yes. What do you want people to remember about you? I want them to remember that I was joyful. Yes. That I was, I am spiritual. I'm loving. And I'm happy. Mm. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this space with you today. I'm so moved. <laughs> it was my great pleasure to know you. Thank you.